Okay, so hello and welcome everyone to this course on Node.js. So this will be a brief introduction video and it will be in about me and what we are going to be learning in this course. So let's get started. So now what is this course all about? Right? So you know let's actually put it this way. This course is for people who want to learn how to develop things. Okay, how to develop actual software applications using something known as Node.js. What is Node.js? We'll be talking about that in the next video. But this course is for developers, strictly developers, right? Uh, and who am I? I'm going to be your instructor. My name is Mohammed Hisham Akhtar. I'm a student at Velour Institute of Technology, Velour, and I'm a second year student. I've done several internships in Node.js and I have about one year of experience with it. I have done several projects in it and the, the links of those projects I will be putting down and you can definitely go check them out. So this is like a very brief introduction video and in the upcoming videos I'll be teaching you a lot more in Node.js and you will be getting everything a beginner needs to get started with development, backend development in general. What is backend development? We'll talk about it in the next video. Okay, so welcome everyone to the second video of this course. This will be a very brief introduction to Node.js and backend development. So let's get started. So what are the topics covered? So the topics covered will be introduction to Node.js, introduction to backend development. Then we learn about APIs and databases. And I won't be teaching all of those in one video. We'll have a huge uh, series of lectures. So stay tuned for that. Uh, what are the prerequisites? You will need to have a basic knowledge of JavaScript. You need to have a text editor, obviously. You need to have Node.js and NPM installed and an active internet connection. All the installation videos are given, so you don't have to worry about that. And as far as knowledge of JavaScript is concerned, if you don't have uh, the basic knowledge of JavaScript, it's fine because I will be going through the basic. But if you do have a basic knowledge, it will be really great. So moving on, what is Node.js? Let's see what Wikipedia says about Node.js. So Wikipedia says Node.js is an open source and cross-platform JavaScript runtime environment which executes JavaScript code outside of the browser. That is a really huge definition and it's really difficult to understand if you do not know the meaning of each and every word on this. So let's actually break it down. So it says Node.js is an, is an open source. What it means is that Node.js is the code of Node.js, which is the source code of Node.js is available to everyone for free and you can go and contribute to it yourself. It is cross-platform, meaning that it can run on Windows, Mac, Linux or any other operating system in the world. And it is a JavaScript runtime environment. So if you don't know already, JavaScript is a language which is mainly run inside of the browser to render the front end of the websites, right? So now if you want to execute JavaScript code not in the browser but on your machine, so what do you do? That is what Node.js does. It runs JavaScript code outside of the browser on your machine's terminal or anything. And that is the good part about Node.js that it runs JavaScript which is used by almost everyone in the browser but now you can also use it to develop the server side of your uh, application. So now what is backend development? Now I'm talking about Node.js and Node.js and backend development really go along well together. But Node.js is not only for backend development. Node.js can be used for anything and backend development is one of its applications. So what is backend development? Backend development is a part of development which deals with the uh, you can say server side of things. So what it means is that in any application it's like an iceberg. Okay, So there is a front end and a back end. The front end is the part which is visible to the user which is like the tip of the iceberg and there is a huge part which is you know behind the user interaction and user doesn't interact with it directly or you can't see it but it's there and it's huge and you know there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into backend development and backend development is a big thing so we'll be learning about how to develop backend development and what all it is everything in detail in the coming videos so you don't have to worry about that now what are the roles of a backend developer you must have already guessed it's something to do with databases servers and security and computing and a lot of those stuff and all of those stuff will be taught in this uh, course and if it will be ta taught in the version 1 and version 2 of this course so watch all the videos properly and ho hope to see you in the next video hello and welcome everyone 
In this section, we are going to install all the required software for the course. Now, some of these softwares are necessary and some of these are optional and I'll be telling you which one is which. In this video, we are going to be talking about Node.js and how we can install Node.js. So first of all, go to the link I provided in the resources section and there you can get the link of this www.nodejs.org. So we'd go to nodejs.org. In here, we, you can go to the download section and you can download the file which is relevant to your distro either Windows, Mac or Linux. On Windows and Mac it's pretty straightforward you can just download the .msi or the .pkg file and the graphical installer will walk you through it. However in Linux it does get a bit tricky. So in Linux what we have done is I have posted another link I want you to go to that link. So in here it gives you a detailed walkthrough of what all you need to do to set up Node.js on your system and I recommend you to just follow these directly. After you are done with the installation, what you should do is go to your terminal and write node minus minus version and you should get something like this and npm minus minus version and you should get something like this. If any of these have an error, you should go through the installation again. Now I am using the long term support version which is 12.16.1 and I recommend you to use this one too. If you are using uh, an older version, I recommend you to upgrade it to this one. Thank you for watching the video. We will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome back everyone. In the previous video, we talked about installing Node.js and in this video, we are going to be talking about Heroku. So Heroku is a way you can host your application and it's definitely recommended to download it because there will be a dedicated section in this course where we are going to learn how to use Heroku. So, before downloading Heroku, you need to download Git. So, go to this link I've given in the docs and download the one which you are running on either Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. Now, in Linux and Mac OS, I believe it comes inbuilt, but in Windows, you need to download it, and the installation is pretty straightforward. So, I don't think you have to worry about it anyway and then install Heroku through this link I've given here. So the Heroku can be installed in many ways. You can install it through NPM. You can install it through Ye in Arch. You can install it through Curl in Debian. You can install it through the Snap Store. In Mac you can install it through the Brew tab. And in Windows you just get the basic installer. And all of these methods are pretty fine. But I recommend you to use the Snap Store if you're on Ubuntu and I recommend you to use the Brew if you're on Mac and the Windows installer if you're on Windows. So after you've installed Heroku, you should be able to go to your terminal and type Heroku minus minus version and you should get something like this. Now if you don't, then I recommend you to go through the installation all over again. And this is it for this video. In the next video, we're going to be talking about Visual Studio Code. So see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. Okay, so hello and welcome back everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about Visual Studio Code. Now Visual Studio Code is a text editor which I will be using throughout the course and I highly recommend you to download it. Now it's not necessary to use Visual Studio Code throughout this course. If you wish to use something else like Atom or Sublime, it's totally up to you. But I would definitely recommend you to download Visual Studio Code because it is one of the best text editors I've come across. So go to this link I've given in the resources section and download the .zip or the .exe file for Windows, the .dev file or .rpm file for Linux and on Mac, the .pkg file or the .dmg file. And the installation is pretty straightforward for Visual Studio Code and I don't think you will run into any problems with the ins installation of Visual Studio Code. After the uh, installation is done, you should be able to see something like this in your applications. Yeah. So this is your Visual Studio Code. And if you don't get a desktop application like that, you could also go to your terminal and type code and it should work. So as I said earlier, it is not necessary to download Visual Studio Code, but I would definitely recommend you doing it. In the next video, we'll be talking about Postman and its installation. So, see you in the next video. 
Hello and welcome back everyone. In this video we are going to be installing Postman. Now Postman is something which is definitely required. Now what Postman does we will be discussing in the course and if you don't get any of Postman right now it's not something to worry about. You can just go to Postman and it automatically detects your distro. You can just come here and download it and after you've downloaded and installed it it should be a pretty straightforward procedure. After you've done it you should come here and you should be able to fire up Postman something like after clicking on that and Postman should open up. So if you don't understand any of these what it means you should not be worried because we'll be discussing all of it in the course of the video and before I end this video let me talk about VS Code plugins. So these are some of the plugins I've listed down in the docs. These are what I would recommend you to download in VS Code. However, if you decide not to download it for some reason, it's absolutely fine. Although it is definitely recommended from my side. Again, if you're using some other text editor other than VS Code, you can ignore this part. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next section. Hello and welcome everyone. In this video, we are going to be talking about the basic data types in Node.js. So we are going to be creating a file named basic.js. So first of all, I'll teach you how to print something in Node.js in the terminal. So we are going to write console.log and we're going to write hello world. And we're going to run this. And as you can see, hello world is printed for us. So this is how we print something in Node.js. So next we are going to be looking at some of the data types in Node.js. But before we go on to data types, I'm going to talk about all these declarations, the ways you can declare a variable or a constant. So the first way to do that is, okay, the first way to do that, you have to type var and you can type any name you want, var a equals to one. So this is one way in which you can declare a variable. So you can also write let b equals to 2 and you can also write const c equals to 3. So now I'll tell you the difference between var, const and let. So first whenever you write const before a variable, it what it basically does is it converts the variable into a constant. So if I type write c equals to 4 again here, it's going to show us an error. And the error is we, it shows that attempting to override c which is a constant. If I run this program, it's definitely going to throw me an error and it says assignment to a constant variable. So that is what JavaScript does not allow us to do. Now, a and b can definitely be changed because they are variables. So we can write a equals to 3. And if we, st and if we just print a out here, and run the program, it's going to print 3 for us because the value of a has been changed to 3. We can, if we, now I'll tell you the difference between var and let. So the difference is very minute. So if we do a var a equals to 1 and then we again write a var a equals to 3 and run the program, it should still work. But if we st start writing something like let b equals to 3, it throws us an error. And if we run it, it will tell us identifier b has already been declared. So the thing with let is you can't write let b equals to 2 and then again write let b equals to 3. So this was how we can declare variables. So now let's come to basic data types. So if I write something like let a equals to 1 and then I do console.log type of a. So the type of basically returns what type of variable a is. And if I write something like this, it will tell us that a is basically a number. So it can be 1, it can also be 1.11. And if we run the program, it will still tell us that a is a number. So now, if I change a to a, and again print it, is going to say that a is a string now because it is encoded in those double quotes. Also we can declare a something like 1 comma 3 comma 5 comma 7 comma 9 and if we do it now 
it shows us that it is an object so now we can there's another way we can declare objects and in the key value pair it can be declared using these curly braces we can type name and it says john and we can type age and it says 21 and then we can run this and it sh still says that a is an object if we print a It, it prints the name is John and the age is 21. So these are the basic data types in JavaScript, which is a number, a string, and an object. The object can be of two types. It can be like a list or it can be like a key value pair dictionary. So this was all about this video, about how basic data types in, uh, can be uh, seen and how basic things can be printed. In the next video, we'll be talking about some more advanced JavaScript. So see you in the next video. Welcome back everyone. So in this video we are going to be learning about if else statements in JavaScript. So we are going to create a file. Okay, so now what we are going to do in this is we are going to learn about if else statements. So what these if else statements do is it is that they control the flow of the program, all right? So let me declare a variable a equal to 1 here. So now I'm going to write if a equal to one console dot log hey else console dot log ho and I'm gonna run this and it's going to print hey. So basically what happens is that first we declare the value of a as one. Now in this se se statement, if a equals to 1, it basically checks if the value of a is equal to 1 or not. And if the value of a is equal to 1, it goes inside, it prints hey and the program ends. It goes to, and it doesn't look at the if else part. Now suppose I change this to 2, and I run the program again, it prints ho. So what basically happens is, if it come here and checks if the value of a is equal to 2 or not, and if the value of a is not 2, it goes to the else part and it prints whatever is there inside the else block. So as you saw, I'm using double equal to here instead of a single equal to. And I'm going to tell you there's something else called triple equal to in JavaScript. So first I'm going to show you something which is very interesting. Suppose I write if a equal to equal to 1, but this time I enclose the 1 in double quotes and I run the program again it prints hey again. So what this double equal to does is it checks just the value of the variable. It does not check the data type of the variable. Now here a is a number and this one enclosed is basically a string, but it does not look at that. It does not care about the data type. However, if we want to also check the data type, we have another way. What we can do is we can use a triple equal to. So after using a triple equal to, now if I run the program, it prints ho and it prints ho because of the fact that now it checks if the value of a is equals to 1 and if the data type of a is also a string or not and since here a is not a not a string it's a number it does not go inside the if part but it executes the statements in the else part so this is what double equal to and triple equal to in javascript are and we'll be learning it in a course about how we can use this to our advantage and how it can sometimes become a dis disadvantage to us too so thank you for watching. In the next video, we're going to be talking about loops. This is it for this video. Thank you. Okay, so welcome back everyone. In the previous video, we learned about if else in JavaScript. In this video, we're going to be talking about loops. So loops as the name suggests is some is a way in which we can loop through something or we can repeat something. So what we what is gonna happen is suppose there are 10 numbers and you want to print all of them so it will be a very tedious job to print it again and again write 10 lines of code so instead what we can do is we can list those numbers and we can loop through them or we can iterate through them and print them and the code becomes much smaller now s printing 10 numbers still seems bit reasonable because you can just write 10 lines of code but what if the number is what 
100 then you won't be sitting and sitting down and writing 100 lines of code for that right so what we are going to do is i'll give i'll introduce you so there are three types of loop you'll be dealing with here we'll be dealing with the for loop the while loop and the for each so what's going to happen is first of all i'm going to look at for loop so i'm going to for uh, type for let i equals to 0 so what this does is it initializes the value of i as 0 i is less than equal to 10 i plus plus and we're going to just do console dot log i so and now we're going to run this so what happens it it prints all the values from 0 to 10 so what basically happens is it first assigns i the value of 0 then it goes inside and it prints console.log i then it again goes back it increases the value of i by 1 through the i plus plus then it checks if the value of i is less than or equal to 10 and then it prints it again and as soon as the value of i becomes equal to 11 and it is greater than 10 and it is not less than or equal to 10 it breaks out of the loop and the program ends so this was one way of doing this program there's another way to do this so what we can do is we can say let i equals to 0 here we can type while i is less than equal to 10 console.log i i plus plus and we can run it again and the exact same thing happens it still prints the values between 0 and 10 so as the name suggests what happens in this is the loop runs until or while y i is less than 10 as soon as the value of i becomes more than 10 the loop ends so what basically happens is it comes here it prints i and the value of i gets incremented it goes back and it sees if the i value of i is less than 10 or not if it is greater than 10 it breaks out and the program ends so now these are two main types of loops in javascript there's one more thing we can do which is very useful suppose there is something like let a equals to suppose there are a couple of strings here suppose something like that and you want to loop through this so what you can do is you can write for a let p of a and you can do console dot log p and if you run this it basically prints each of the elements in the object hisham ang and sha so this is one way to do this and an alternative syntax for this you can also do a dot for each oops a dot for each and you can write data and you can do console.log data here I'll just put the semicolons and now when I run this the exact same sh thing should happen so first it got printed because of the one earlier this one and then it got printed because of this one so these are two ways to do the exact same thing so this was all about loops in JavaScript. In the next video, we're going to be talking about functions. So don't forget to watch the next video. Thank you for watching. Okay, so welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to learn about functions. So let's create a file. So now what are functions? Well, functions are any block of code which performs the particular task. So you can call that function anywhere you want to in your code and it will perform a particular task for you any it can be anything from basic printing some small thing to performing some big database query or anything like that so basically in JavaScript before 2015 the syntax to like declare a function was different and the one which is used right now in the ES version 6 is somewhat different so I'm going to show you both the syntax so first I'm going to show you the syntax which was used before 2015 so I'm going to write function print data and I'm going to do console.log data so 
So what this block of code will do is it will call the function print. Now when the function print is called basically what happens is print takes in one parameter here and then it prints it out. So if we run this code it should print Hisham. Now there's another way to write this exact same thing which was which is currently used in ES version 6. So we should give here ES version 6. It, it was introduced after 2015. So what we're going to do is we're going to write const print equals to and we're going to do a parenthesis like this. We're going to write data then an equal to and a greater than sign and then open these curly braces and do a console.log data. Well this block of code does the exact same thing. It's just an alternate syntax. So as you can see this function print can be called multiple times. I can call print hasham here like this. I can again call print key and if I run it I should print hasham and key because the function was called two times. Now this is all about functions. We're going to learn about asynchronous functions in the next video. So stay tuned and thank you for watching. Okay, welcome back everyone. So in this video we are going to be learning about callbacks. So we're going to create a file called callbacks.js. So now what we are going to do is now I'm going to introduce you to a couple of things in here. So suppose first of all let's declare a variable called fruits and give it some fruits say apple banana orange so now I'm going to call a function I'm going to create a function named const get fruits And what this function will basically do is it will iterate through this entire fruits. So it will be like for fruits dot for each. Okay, so what this basically this get fruits function does is it loops through the fruits array and it prints it. It prints each element of it. So now we're gonna call get fruits and run the program. And you see apple, banana, and orange. So now I'm going to introduce you to something called a set timeout function. So I'm going to do a set timeout. So now I'm going to explain what this means, but before that, let me get the syntax correct. So what the set timeout does is it executes this set of code after 1000 milliseconds. So 1000 milliseconds basically makes up 1 second. One second. So this, this thing is going to get executed after 1 second of running. So but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it again. So we're going to wait for some time and then it prints it. So you see that delay that happens to be set timeout. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some other function known as const post fruit. What this does is it takes a fruit I'm going to give a set timeout to this too. As you can see And I'm going to give it 2000 milliseconds here. And I'm going to do fruits dot push. And I'm going to push of the data with the which, we, which we are getting here, which is the fruit. All right. So now I'm going to run this. First, I'm going to call post fruit, say kiwi, and then get fruit. And now see what is going to happen. What will happen is it will print apple, banana and orange and it won't print kiwi. 
Now I'll tell you why this is happening. So when we did a set timeout here in one millisecond, what happened actually in this program is that this post fruit took two seconds to execute and get fruit took one second to execute. So get fruits got executed, it was already got printed and a program ended. So now what you what can you do to prevent this? What can you do so that all of your four fruits are printed now? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce you to something known as callbacks. So what I'm gonna do is you're gonna pass another parameter here called callback. And we are gonna do fruits.push fruit and then we are gonna call callback, something like this. And while we are and while calling the function what we're gonna do is we're gonna all we are gonna do kiwi and then we are gonna do get fruits. And now when we run this, we wait for some time and all four are printed. So what basically callback is callback is basically a function passed in the parameter of another function. So what the, when what will happen in this is first it will push the fruit and then this callback is called. Now what is this callback? This callback is basically a parameter in the function and what we are passing as a parameter is this get fruits function here. So when it calls the callback something like this, this function gets invoked and this gets executed only after this fru fruit is pushed which you have given here as kiwi and hence apple, banana, orange and kiwi all of them have been printed. So this was one way to deal with something like this. In the next video we are going to be talking about promises which is another way to deal with something like a situation like this. So see you in the next video and stay tuned. Okay so welcome back everyone. In the previous video we learned about callbacks as a way to deal with asynchronous functions. So now we are going to learn about promises. Promises you can say is a new way to deal with asynchronous functions and it is very important because we will be using a lot of promises in our upcoming videos. So we are going to be dealing with the same exact issue which we dealt in the last video. So I'm going to copy and paste this code here. But there's going to be a change in the post fruits. So I'm, I'm going to write const post fruits equals to it takes a parameter as usual. But now what we'll do is we'll return something called a promise. Return new promise. It takes in two parameters resolve comma reject. And then the syntax for this function is the exact same after this now. We are going to take this part, control C and paste it here. We are going to remove this callback because that doesn't exist anymore. And we are going to set a variable let ERR equals to false. If there is no error, then resolve the promise. else reject the promise with a message something went wrong all right so what is a promise a promise you can say is what the name says is it guarantees that either something will be performed and if some error happens it will be rejected but so now how to use a promise in the syntax so we can do post fruits kiwi oops the spelling and we can use the dot then operator and we can pass in get fruits in that and we can use the dot catch and if there catch an error and we can console log the error so what basically happens is this promise if there is no error I have set the error to default as false if there is no error it will resolve the promise what this resolve does is basically if when we call postfruits.kiwi and it returns a resolved promise then this dot then part will be performed and get fruits will be called after this has been fruits.push has been performed and this function will be called and our printing will be done however if something wrong occurs in between then this promise will be rejected so when if this return new promise rejects a, rejects something 
they will come to this dot catch part and whatever it gets in this reject it will just print it so just to demonstrate this first of all I'm gonna run this to make sure everything's working fine and you can see apple banana origin kiwi like the exact same thing before it's gonna get printed now suppose if I set this error to true from the start and if I did it something like this it says something went wrong so this is how you can write a promise basically a promise is just another way to deal with some of these asynchronous functions and the syntax here makes much more sense than this callbacks because in this we're just calling the function after this but in promise we get a guarantee that this will be executed after that has been executed and we can also check for errors in promises so this is all about promises in the next video we'll be learning about async and await functions and that is also very important we'll be using it a lot in the course of the video so see you in the next video thank you for watching okay so welcome back everyone so in the previous video we learned about promises and how we can use dot then and dot catch to handle promises now as javascript is evolving every day in es version 8 what happened was there came a new syntax which we could use to handle promises so it, it two keywords were introduced called async and await and we're going to learn how to use that in this video so this part of the this part remains the exact same so we're going to copy it we're going to tell that we're going to use es version 8 and I'll, t I'll show you how to use async and await so we have to create a new function say init and it is an async function now this async means that we can use the keyword await inside it so we're going to do a try and a catch and if this catch has any error we're going to do console.log error inside the try block we are going to write await post fruits and then we are going to write get fruits in the post fruits here we are going to write kiwi and then finally we are going to call init so when we call init it comes in here it sees if there is any error or not if there is any error it prints it but if there is no error it comes in here so what happens when, it, when this await function is put before this post fruits now what this await does is it tells post fruits to get executed and the program doesn't go further after post fruits gets executed then get fruits comes here it comes to the next line and then it executes the get fruits and we see it printed so now let's run this and as, as you can see apple banana origin kiwi is printed now if we remove this await from here and if we ra run this again then we just print apple banana and orange so this await keyword is what makes the difference this await keyword basically tells the program to wait until post fruits gets executed and then it executes get fruits so these three concepts of callbacks promises and async await is really important because we'll be talking about all this in very detail in the upcoming videos because we'll see that a lot of inbuilt functions in the database query and all is written using promises so we will need to use dot then dot catch and async await very frequently so it's very important that you understand these concepts very well so you can watch this, vid watch this video a couple of times and if you don't understand something you can definitely contact me in the Q&A section of this course thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video Okay, so welcome back everyone. In this video, we are going to be talking about how you can use one function which is defined in one file inside another file. So it is pretty simple to do it. What you have to just do is you have to write module dot exports equals to and the name of that function. And then you can create another file name exec.js. Come here. And in this we can define a new variable say const print 
equals to and we can use the require keyword so what we have to do in this require keyword is we have to in double quotes we have to specify the path of that file from which the from which we want to import something and we have to specify the relative path and the relative path is pretty much satisfactory we're gonna do and then and now what you're going to do is we're going to call print to print here just to make sure there's nothing in here now what we're going to do is we're going to go to our terminal then you're going to type node exec.js and prints here <coughs> so this is how you can use one function which is defined inside a file in another file so now suppose there are two functions in this file say const opt equals to data console.log data and it prints it two times suppose this is the case so now you want to export both so what you can do is you can do module.export.print equals to print and module dot exports dot opt equals to opt and inside exit.js what we can do is I'll, I'm going to show you two types of syntax here so the first syntax is you can require any variable and then you can call dot print and you can say hey dot opt and you can say ho and now let's run this and it prints hey ho ho so basically it calls the print function inside this func and prints whatever it has got and this and it calls this opt and it prints it two times and we can see the output here now a similar way of doing this in a we can call it an alternative syntax would be something like this all right now we come here and we type print a type opt I type ho and we run it again and it does the exact same thing print hey and ho so these are the two ways you can use a file to do something which has been defined in another file and this is very important because in the upcoming videos we'll be using this keyword module.exports a lot so it's better you understand this and this is it for this section in the next section we'll be learning about how to create our own server and run our own application for it so stay tuned and see you in the next video okay so hello guys and welcome back to another video from this course so in this video we're going to be learning how to set up our own node.js project so first i'm going to fire up the terminal i'm going to cd into my desktop and i'm going to create a directory name for server now before first of all i'm going to cd into first server and then first before we get started with anything first i want you to check node minus minus version npm minus minus version there you go if you don't get something like that then i recommend you to go and check the installation again so now i want you to type code dot and it's going to open up visual studio code for you and it's going to open the folder for so so now i want you to fire up the terminal in here and run npm in it and i want you to go and pressing enter after the process is done we're going to get something like a package.json here so in the package.json i want you to edit it and write start here And here I want to write nodemon index.js 
something like that and hit save after that I want you to install npm install node mode alright after it's been installed you should see a node modules here so all of that and you don't have to worry about this node modules being so long because you're never gonna use it you don't have to edit any of these files it's just there as the modules and you're gonna see something like a package lock.json here even you never have to do anything with this so you can leave it like that in this package.json here you should see a node mod added so this is it for this video, this is how you can set up a project. In the next video, I'll be teaching you how to create your own first server. Thank you for watching. Okay, so hello and welcome back guys. We're gonna pick up from where we started in the last video. So now, I want you to type index.js, basically create a new file called index.js. And in this file, I want you to write const http equals to require HTTP now HTTP is an inbuilt node package so you don't have to install it explicitly like we install nodemon now I want you to type HTTP dot create server something like this a request comma response server is up and running res.n and then write dot listen 3000 alright something like that format the code save it after that fire the terminal from here and write npm start so it should show started here I want you to go to your browser and type localhost 3000 and you should see something like that server is up and running. So this is how you could create your own server using the HTTP module and I guess this is it for this video. In the next video we are going to be learning how to create a server but with express and express is a very fast and extensive package which can be used to run a lot of things and I will tell you how to create your own server using express in the next video. Thank you for watching. Okay, so hello and welcome back people. So in the last video I told you how we'll be using Express to create our own server. So first of all I want you to remove all that and come back here and type npm install express. Alright, after that's done I want you to check your package.json and express should be added here now I want you to come here and type const express equals to require express so now after doing that I will type const app equals to express now I will type app dot get request comma response server is up and running and then app dot listen 3000 comma another callback and I'm just going to console dot log here server is up and running after we got all that in place hit save and then do npm start so here it says server is up and running go to your local host again and you should see server is up and running so this is how you could create your own server using express and uh, you'll be asking why we are going why we are using express 
and you'll find out very soon why express is very useful in routing and stuff like that but that will be the next section of this course thank you for watching this video and i hope to see you in the next video hello and welcome back everyone to this course so in this section we are going to be learning about apis i'll go through the outline so first we learn about apis or application programming interfaces then we learn about json or javascript object notation which is a way to represent data then we learn about rest apis and then four http methods that every developer should know about so let's get started so apis so what does api stand for api means application programming interface and what exactly is it is it's how the front end communicates with the back end so whenever a back end developer is developing something what he actually develops is he creates an api and then he documents it and then he gives it to the front end developer and what the front end developer does is he calls this api which is hosted on some remote server and then he sends it some data or gets back some data from it as the back end developer has mentioned in his documentation so now moving on data so how is data actually stored or represented well the most popular way to do that is javascript object notation or json it is just a syntax to store data and i can't tell you all about json right now but as we go on with the course you will be learning a lot about how json is written and how we can actually use it so now what is a rest api well rest api stands for representational state of transfer and it suggests to create an object of the data requested by the client and send the values of the object in response to the user what it actually means is that suppose you want to book a movie or something like that then what you can do is you can send the data to the server and the server makes an entry in the database that yes this guy wants to watch a movie at this point of time and then it will send back the response to you saying hello it's saved so when you go there and uh, go to the movie hall and then you actually make a request to the server and ask him does this guy have a booking and the server says yes this guy does have a booking so this is how you can interact with the server right and rest api is one way to interact with the server in rest apis we use something known as get and post request and patch request and of course delete request and these are four methods that every http that every developer should know about and these are http requests or hypertext transfer protocols so now what is a get request a get is request basically it means that you want to get some data from the server at some specified resource so so any data you have to send to the server has to be appended to the url of the of that particular endpoint and that is the only way you can send some data to the server and you can get back the data corresponding to that endpoint now what is a post request now post request as a name suggests is used to send some data to the api or the server so suppose you want to actually make a booking in the movie right so you have to send some data to the server right so you can't just send all the details appended to the url only right so you have to send it in something known as a body of the request that is where post request comes in in get request there is no body of a request but in post request you can send data to the server in the body well a patch request what a patch request basically is used for is to update something suppose you book a movie but then you realize you're not free at that point of time and you want to change the timing so what you will have to do is you will have to send a patch request to the database to change the timing of the movie and the delete request well you want to cancel your booking so what are you going to do you're going to just tell the server to delete your entry and these four requests are pretty important and you, you need to understand the usage of where to use each of these and you will get to understand more of these as we go on well thank you for watching and in the next video we'll be learning about how to actually code all of this so stay tuned for the next video and welcome back everyone so now in this video we are going to be learning about how you can make your own rest api and actually test it using the software we downloaded called postman so the first thing we need to do is we need to get started with the project right so first i'm going to write npm in it and we went through the standard procedure we've been here before so you get your package.json here change this scripts and put a proper script right here 
as we had done before. Okay, so that's done. Now we'll create an index.js file. All right. And we'll install some more modules which we will be needing. So npm install. We'll install express. We'll install something known as cores. We'll install something known as body parser. And we're gonna hit enter. And after it's installed, let's clear this and exit. All right. So now we need to create a server, obviously. So we are going to write app equals to require express, right? And we're going to do app dot listen, and we're going to say three thousand comma. console dot log connected to server. All right, and we can also do an app dot get here to make sure right after we do that it is connected to server and if we fire up the browser and we go to local 3000 it says server is up so we now we know that our server is running and this is pretty standard and we've done it before in this course and if you do not know how you what is actually happening you should go back to the previous videos and check that out so now First, let's create a folder called routes and in that folder, let's create our first, say something like routes, route.js. So now, so now we will, we will use what we said about our module.expose if you remember. We're going to use that concept. We're going to use the concept of middlewares. We're going to use express routing, a lot of things. So let's get started. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to say const routes equals to require. And then we're going to give the relative path of this JS file called routes. So routes, all right. And then we're gonna use something like app dot use slash routes comma routes. So what this will do is it'll make the express app which we've created go to this routes file and it will make it use it. Basically, this is how you can set a middleware or you can tell the express app to actually use this route, whatever you've created here in its app so here we're gonna do const router any variable name i prefer to use router and we're going to require it which will be express dot and we're gonna write router so what this express router does is it allows us to create multiple routes so in this video, we'll be creating a very basic route, which will be a simple get request. So we're going to do router.get and we're going to write ping comma and we're going to write a request and response. So what basically it means request and response is that request is what you actually get and response is what you actually have to send. So this will be pretty simple. What we'll do is if it gets ping, it'll send res dot send and we'll send pong. All right. 
you're gonna do this you're gonna hit save you're gonna write module dot exports equals router so after we've actually done this, this is very important to do module dot exports router and after we've done module dot exports router this routes here so what will actually happen is it will be localhost 3000 slash routes slash ping you get how it's actually working so if you make another router here and say that one is pong so it will be slash routes slash pong that's how you can actually route it so now we'll go to postman so postman is a software which makes it very easy to test all your apis so we'll give it some time to load all right first we'll make sure that our thing is running we haven't uh, switched on our app yet so what we'll what i'm going to do is i'm going to do npm start it says there's no notebond of oh, we forgot to install Nodemon. So we'll install Nodemon. And then do an npm start. Alright, so now it's connected to server. So now we should be able to go to Postman and we'll create a an untitled request. You don't have to worry about anything. And you have to write here HTTP localhost 3000 slash routes slash ping so this was our route and the response we should get is a pong and if we go here we'll see that the response we get is pong so postman is very useful when it comes to actually writing something and then if you want to test it it would be very tedious right to have a front-end developer make an api call and then test it it would be pretty easy if there was a tool for us to actually test it properly and postman gives us the exact right graphical interface for it so now let's actually make some changes to our code so here instead of doing a res.send pong i'm actually going to do something i'm going to write res.json and i'm going to create a javascript object and i'm going to going to say response and response has to be pong i'm going to hit save and it again is connected to server and now when i hit save it gives me a proper structured data or a json data which says response and the response is pong so this is where actually json comes in so now if you actually want to send a proper data to your front end they wouldn't like you sending just normal text data right they would want you to send proper data to them this is how you can actually serialize the data properly in the JSON and send it to them so that it's easier for them to actually represent it. Well, that's all for this video. Now, what I'll do in the next video is I'll teach you how to create a post route and a patch route. So stay tuned. Okay, so hello and welcome back everyone. Let's pick up where we started last time. So now, last time we used express routing to create a GET request. So now I'm going to show you how you can create a POST request. So first of all, before coming here, I'll have to make some changes to it. So now, what if you want to, I told you that POST request has something known as a body, right? So there is, there should be a way actually in which you can get data from this body. And that is why we install something known as body parser. So we'll require body parser. in our index.js file it's very important that you do it in your index.js file because you'll be using it everywhere and then we're going to set a middleware saying app.use bodyparser.json I'm gonna hit save also gonna do app.use bodyparser.url encoded right so now it is very mandatory for you to write these two lines whenever you have to use body parser otherwise your app won't work so now after we've done this we can go to our routes.js file 
and we can do a router dot post and what this will do is it will create a post request so let's say this is ping and we'll go here we'll create a request comma response and let's make our api do something here so first we'll do const request equals to request dot body and uh, what you're going to do is we're going to just do res dot json request all right now we're going to hit save and you know it will get a bit confusing if you use ping both both ways so let's make this one pong all right so now we'll come here we'll change it from get to post and we'll go here and say pong all right and we'll go to the body here so now you can see that there are a lot of ways you can use it so we'll go and select a draw and select a json here all right and we're gonna send something like hey hello and we're gonna hit send and it sends back whatever we've sent it in the body so whenever you do this request dot body you can actually do it because you're using the body parser middleware all right so now we'll actually make it do something so we'll say if request dot ping so if there is something called a request dot ping then we'll send back the request else res dot status so now what is a status well status or status codes are pretty useful and there are plenty of http status codes which i think you should definitely learn you can go and type them on google and 400 is basically stands for bad request and we'll say json and we'll say error not allowed and we'll wrap that into a string all right and we'll hit save and so now if we do the same thing it'll say error not allowed so this can actually you know be used to make sure that the data which is being sent is correct so now if i say ping hello what i'll do is it'll send me back ping hello so this is what is pretty important so i'll show you i'll walk you through it so when you did request dot ping what you actually did was you tapped into this json and you actually read the value of the key ping and it and in here what it actually checked was if there is something called a request dot ping or not this if statement and if there was something called a request dot ping or if the body had a key which has ping in it then it sent back the thing and if there was no ping in the body it just returned not allowed so now we'll also create a patch request router dot patch and this one let's say ping pong or something like that doesn't matter because it's just a name right request comma response so now we'll again take it const request equals to request dot body if request dot underscore id equals to equals to ping rest dot json response and it is pong else res dot status 400 dot json error not allowed 
we're gonna hit save properly and now we're gonna come here so remember request was ping pong something like that we'll come here and we'll change it to a patch request and we'll come here and we'll see that if there is a key called underscore id and if it is ping it will send back pong to us otherwise it's just gonna say an error so we have to modify our body here we have to make it underscore id and we're gonna make it ping and if we say it'll say in the response right pong so what this patch request does is, uh, is actually it's changing the value of this ping to pong all right so this was how you could use express routers to create all these sorts of requests and what you've actually done now is you've created a simple rest api for yourself in with express routing so this is it for this section of the course i hope you understood each concept of an express and a body parser and a get request and a post request and everything in the next section what we will do is we'll learn about something known as a database and then we'll integrate our rest api with a proper database and make it much more functional than it actually is as of now so thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video okay so hello and welcome everyone in this section of the course we are going to be learning all about databases and how we can connect to them using our node.js app in this lecture we'll be talking about databases then we'll talk about two major types of database which is the sql and nosql databases then we'll uh, discuss some of the popular sql and nosql based systems and then we'll come to this database which we will be using and learning in this course which is mongodb so well what is a database well database is a systematic collection of data databases support storage and manipulation of data and it makes data management easy now suppose you book a movie all right so what you're going to tell your movie hall is that you've booked a movie at some particular time and you'll provide some data to the movie hall that which movie you want to watch at what time do you want to watch what your name is how many people are going to watch along with you what is the seat number and everything so all of that has to be stored somewhere so now you can't store everything in your backend server right so it has to be stored somewhere that is where database comes in database is where all the information is stored so whenever a person from the front end he contacts the back end what the back end does is it contacts the database and it gets the data from the database and gives it either back to the front end or if the front end wants to post some data to the database it tells the server that hey you can now put this particular data in this particular format in the database and the ba back end server your api actually does that so moving on well there are two types of database the sql and no sql database well sql stands for structured query language and no sql obviously means not a structured query language so now we'll jump into what they are and the differences between them sql is a relational database management system and no sql is distributed so what it means is in sql is very easy to relate two different types of data to each other whereas in no sql it's not uh, that easy to relate them but it's more of distributed it's now coming back to sql well sql is vertically scalable so what actually happens in sql is that data is stored in forms of tables all right so it's very easy to count how many number of rows there are in the table and stuff like that so it's very scalable that way but no sql well no sql might not be very scalable when it comes to vertically but it's very horizontally scalable because of the fact that no, in no sql there's no schema the schema is very dynamic and it's very good for hierarchical data so what you can do is you can store date you can store the properties of one thing in like an array or in an object and it's very easy for you to you know store a lot of information about one particular thing well the drawback of no sql is that it cannot be used for very complex sort of queries whereas sql is very good for complex queries 
Now, there are a lot of SQL based systems which a lot of big companies use like PostgreSQL, MySQL, MariaDB and Microsoft SQL Server. There are plenty of SQL systems other than these four and a lot of company use a lot of them. And if you want to, you know, get a proper knowledge about databases and like how many types of databases are there, you can go to this link landscape.cncf.io. I've put the link in the resources section of this video and I'm sure you should check that out. Now coming to NoSQL systems, where there are a lot of NoSQL systems like MongoDB, Redis, Couchbase, Cassandra and so many more like IBM Cloud Server and there's the list is endless. Now MongoDB, we are going to be using MongoDB for this particular course. So MongoDB is a document oriented NoSQL database which is used for data storage of course. And in MongoDB the data is not stored in rows and columns like in SQL but in MongoDB the data is stored in the form of JSON or JavaScript object notation. We talked a lot about it in our last section and since it is very easy to send and receive JSON data from Node.js because Node.js is using JavaScript and JSON literally says JavaScript object notation that's why we are going to be using MongoDB but that is not the only reason why we are going to be using MongoDB actually well there are plenty of reasons to use MongoDB MongoDB reduces operation overhead up to 95% so you don't have to write very complex queries and all that MongoDB has a lot of functions inbuilt in it with its aggregation framework from which you can perform really you know intensive queries in a short period of time and it has a very flexible architecture the storage the way you can since you store data in the form of JSON it is very easy to store very complex formatted data in it you can store data inside another data or something like that it's very hierarchical it's very easy and its writing performance is very good so you want to write something to the database from the server it's very easy to do bulk operations and stuff like that and of course MongoDB has a very large community there's a lot of people around MongoDB and whenever you're facing a problem regarding MongoDB well all you can do is just google it and you will find someone with the same problem who has actually solved it so this community is very good and that is why we'll be using MongoDB in this course so as you can see I've listed out why we are going to be using MongoDB and as I discussed earlier it has a lot of commercial support it is very easy for scaling and it never almost fails it's always it always works so thank you for watching this video in the next video we're going to be actually using MongoDB in our system in our Node.js app so thank you for watching this video and hope to see you in the next video okay so welcome back everyone to this new video in this video we're going to be actually connecting to our database using uh, the Node.js app and the database which we are going to be using is MongoDB as I had discussed in the earlier video so before we get down to coding it what we need to do is we need to actually create a cloud database and then get credentials from from there all right so now I want you to go to mongodb.com like this and of course I am signing in because I already have a an account but if you don't have an account you can just create an account from here and it will just sign me in and MongoDB actually takes some time to create a database as you can see already have a lot of databases here but we are going to be creating a new project I'm going to be naming this connection course all right I'm going to say next I'm the project owner I can add a lot of people in here who can share this database with me so when you're working in a team in a company or something you can do that and I'm going to press create project after I've created a project so what you need to do now is you have to create a cluster where you'll actually store your data so you click on build your cluster there's a lot of options you can actually use to create a cluster where you can create a shared cluster or a dedicated cluster for yourself or a lot of things you can do with it so 
shared uh, we'll just be creating a shared cluster as of now because that's the one which is free you can choose your region well i'm living in india so i'm going to be using the service in mumbai you can also use google cloud cloud aws or azure it depends on whatever you want to use this cluster tier is m0 sandbox and we're get getting shared ram and 512 mb storage and you know i know that 512 mb is not a lot of data but believe me that's all you'll be needing for this course and of course if you are thinking of building your own startup or something you would want to get more data out of there and if we just look at it there's a lot of ways there's a lot of pricing on here which will give you 2 gb 5 gb and all of this and you know there's a pretty much everything you can get in here this is like brilliant for you we'll be naming a cluster something we'll name it as example or something like that and we're going to be creating a cluster and creating a cluster actually takes some time okay so we're going to be waiting for that particular time and during that time i'm just going to go to network access and you actually need to tell mongodb which all networks are you allowing allowing mongodb to connect to so right now as of now i'm going to allow access from anywhere i'm going to confirm that and as you can see saying pending and it says deploying changes we're going to be coming to database access and we're going to be adding a user for the database so i'm going to name it my name hisham i'm going to put in a password say example as you can see here all right and i'm the atlas admin and suppose you want to add someone who wants to just see the database you don't want them to make changes so you can do only read any database or something like that well as i'm going to do atlas admin i'm going to add user says update password i'll just ignore that and as you can see it's deploying the cluster here we need to just wait for some time so that our changes have been deployed so what we're going to do is after this thing has been created we're actually going to get a url from it and then we're going to use that url to connect this particular database to our mongodb and a node.js app so we're going to be waiting for some time it usually takes some time to actually build it because what it has to, to do is it has a cloud server so it has to you know take your request in process it a lot the certain amount of data for you and all that stuff a lot of background stuff is going on in here you can see here is written that aws mumbai and it's a m0 sandbox which is a tier of it and it says it's already saying new clusters take between 1 to 3 minutes to provision so yeah it takes some time to do that well that that alert has gone so i'm guessing that should be ready any moment for us now so while it deploys i'm going to tell you about something about mongodb compass all right so here there's this app called mongodb compass which is very handy and it is an easy way to actually check your database without actually going to your browser all the time and we'll be using mongodb compass in here to connect to our ye to connect to our database and actually you know check our data and that way we won't have to come into the browser and sign in and everything again so as you can see it's built now so we're going to press connect on here this is connect with the mongo shell mongo shell is some why would you want to connect with the mongo shell i mean you can but we'll be connecting it with our application and it also says here connect with mongo db compass we'll be connecting with the application so here it says connection string only or the full driver example which is going to be using connection string and here it can say select your driver or version or anything like that not just if you are using some other language you might want to select some other language here right here something like that but we'll be using node js and you think to the version 3 all right so we're going to be copying this url from here and it says password here so now after we've copied that you can minimize the browser you can come to compass here and you can paste it 
and wherever it says password you have to actually put the password of the user you had actually been using the user we created and I had named it example so I'm gonna put my example in there and I'm gonna do connect and mongodb compass is actually going to connect to it so now now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a directory say db something like that we're gonna cd into it and we're going to do npm in it it's basically setting up our project we're going to open a visual studio code we're going to create an index.js in here we're going to package.json and we're going to create a start script for ourselves which is obviously very important alright now we'll fire the terminal we'll install the basic things npm install express express is very important because express is what we are using all the time we're also going to install nodemon and whenever I do the save dev what it actually does is it adds it in the dev dependencies of this project and on the dependencies so you'll understand what I'm saying here so yeah here you see dev dependencies that's how that's what that save dev tag is actually used for in npm installer and we're going to be installing body parser and we're going to be installing something called mongoose so mongoose is actually a driver which has been made uh, for connecting to mongodb all right and we're also going to install something called dot env and i will get to it why we are actually using that so first let's install it now come into index.js file first we'll set up our express server Alright, we're gonna do app dot listen and we're gonna do three thousand here. Alright, so we've set up a server here we will require some other packages or the middlewares which you're going to be using such as body parser which we've talked about in these previous videos and if you're not able to understand what i'm talking about in here you better go and watch the previous videos because all of these have been discussed in the previous videos all right so now now since we now added a body parser now suppose I want to connect to the database which is the database which we just created so first of all to do that I'll have to require mongoose now I'm going to write here mongoose dot connect alright and then we have to put our URL string in here which was this and the password was example and then we are going to do dot then connect it to database dot catch alright we're gonna hit save we're gonna format this 
and now we're going to actually come here to our terminal and hit npm start all right so you can as you can see it's just connected to database but we get two different warnings out here all right so now we're going to solve those warnings it says you have to add new url password is equals to true and use unified topology equals to true and I actually didn't add this at the first go because of the fact that i wanted you all to actually see these two errors which have been coming here the warnings and then i wanted to solve it and Right, we're gonna hit save and we're gonna do npm start again and as you can see there's no warnings anymore all right it says connected to database two times well of course it will because in app.listen i said it connected to database well we can just change this to server is running and you can hit save it says server is running and connected to database now suppose i have to actually deploy my code somewhere and this connection string is something which i shouldn't be showing to everyone because it contains my password right here all right F for the sake of this video we can act i'm actually using the password something like an example but you'll always be using some more secure password or stuff like that and if you're pushing this on to some github repository or something like that you wouldn't want everyone to see this password right and to hide this entire url but still be able to connect to your app we are using the dot env module so we've already installed the dot env module now we're going to require it so we're going to say const dot env equals to require dot env all right and then we are going to write dot env dot config that's all you have to do and now you have to come here and make a file called .env all right and you have to come here i'll take this from up here we're going to say something like db something like database url equals to and then we're going to paste this here and since it's an array variable file you don't have to give those quotes on here all right also i'll tell you something it's a good idea to actually not use the port right here by hard coding it but actually putting it in the env file so we're also going to write so we're going to remove this from here and we're going to write port here and i'm going to write 3000 all right so now since we've configured the env file now how do you use this database url in port in here so what you have to write in here is process dot env dot data base underscore url all right just as you written here and you have to write here process dot env dot port right now we're gonna fire up the terminal and do an npm start again and it says server is up and running and connected to database so now we successfully established a connection between a node.js app and the database in the coming videos i'll be showing you how you can make entries to the database and how you can retrieve entries to, to that database and how you can actually change all of that so that's it for this video and i'll see you in the next video okay so welcome back everyone to this video so now in this video we're going to be actually doing something with our database all right so first of all i'm going to create a folder called model so now whenever you're actually creating something or you know adding any entry to your database you need to have something known as a schema for it or a model for it all right so i know i said that nosql databases do not follow any particular schema and believe me it doesn't but here we have to actually have tell something to the database right that this is what this is going to be or something like that all right so we have to create a schema for it 
and it's very simple to create a schema. So first of all, we're going to be using Mongoose to create the schema because of course, Mongoose is our driver for everything. So we're going to be requiring Mongoose, all right? And we're going to be creating the sim schema of a simple post, all right? So we're gonna say const post equals to new mongoose.schema, all right? And inside this, we actually have to give a JSON to this mongoose.schema. So I want my post to have a title, all right? And the title of the post has to be there. So required is true, all right? And type of the title will actually be a string. Now, every post has a title and uh, description you can see you can uh, change it or anything you can create another schema if you want to well i want to keep the title and description as for now so i want every post to also have a description and its type will also be a string now after i've done this i'm going to write module.exports equals to mongoose dot model posts comma post all right so this is how we create a schema now we're going to be creating another folder called routes where we will create all our routes to actually post something to the database so Let's create a file in it called post.js. And now, first of all, we are going to be using express routing as we discussed in the previous section. So we're going to be using express dot router. Now we're going to do a router dot post, which we which is basically writing something to the database comma request and the response and in here we are going to be also uh, you also have to require something called the schema of the post so we're going to be requiring post equals to require and we're going to be giving the relative path of the schema we created all right and I'm going to do here const title equals to request dot body dot title const description equals to request dot body dot description. All right. Now we're going to be writing. Also, by the way. I forgot to do this but we will make our function async all right now we're going to be using const new post equals to new post and we're going to be giving the title as the title variable we created and the description as the description all right so now we are going to be writing const save post equals to await new post dot save all right so this dot save is actually a function which comes in built with mongoose all right so we're going to say await new post save and we're going to say rev.json save post. Alright, we're going to hit save. And we're going to do module.export equals router. We'll come to index.js here. 
and in here we'll add some more middleware we'll do an app.use posts comma require routes posts right we'll hit save and make sure everything's all right title description a title and description here you save the post you hit save make sure index.js is saved we'll do an npm start here server is running connected to database we will fire up postman so with that we can actually test our api which we just currently made so it says localhost 3000 here and it will be localhost 3000 posts as i had post put here and this was just a route so slash posts and i'm going to be putting a title in here it says post number one and a description in here which says this is my first post something of that sort we can put in anything in the title and description as long as it is a string i'm going to be hitting send it says cannot get post because it was a post route so yeah now It throws an error saying res.son is not a function. We can come to a post and of course we've put a res.son here. It, it is actually going to be json here. So now, here, and we hit, I, we hit it and here's it, here it is, id. So now, this these are two fields that MongoDB creates on itself. The first one is id and the second one is this weird looking underscore underscore v. Well, this underscore underscore v is what tells how many times this thing has been changed or updated and this underscore id is what mongodb generates for us it is like this unique way in which you can differentiate your post so now i'm going to go to compass here and I'm going to hit refresh so here comes a database name called test here and you can see posts here and you, when you come here and you see this is my first post and actually the entry has been done two times because the first time uh, we had done a res.son here which was an error on my part but the post was already saved before that so the database actually took the entry but the response was actually faulty so we can delete a document here whatever now we can say post number this is my second post or something like that and I can hit and it says post number 2 this is my second post let's add a few more posts here third post fourth post And a fifth post so now when we come back to our database and we hit refresh you can see there are five entries in the database with the title and description the id and everything out here so now what we're going to do is we're going to be creating a route so that you can get all the posts from the database so we're going to be doing a router.get comma async request comma response and what we are going to be doing here is we are going to say const post equals to await post dot find and we are going to be giving nothing in here so whenever we give nothing to this post dot find right here it will send back all the posts now we do res.json 
posts all right and i'm going to be putting this as get posts and since just posting a post isn't a very you know logical route for to put it in the root we're just going to post putting something like new post here all right so now i'm going to do get posts as had written in here and since this is a get request i'll change it get request don't have any body or anything like that and first of all we're going to start our app doing npm start so that it's up and running so it says connected to the database so that's cool and this can't get it well of course it, it can't get it because it has to be posts here now that's fine so now we can see all posts are here actually the error was that I hadn't put this slash post here as in my app so it wasn't working but we fixed it so you can see all the entries we had actually created the database we can actually retrieve from it so post 1 post 2 post 3 post 4 and post 5 so now I want to actually update the description of my post somehow you know maybe I want to change the description and you know that edit button which is always there in there so how do you do that well to do that what we're gonna do is I'm gonna write here router dot patch so obviously we're going to be editing something so it's going to be a patch request so we're going to say edit description request and response alright so now you need to give the computer or the database something from which you can uniquely identify a post all right so now we're going to be using the post id to differentiate between these posts because the post id is the thing which is actually the most unique among all of these and every post id is going to be different so we can rely on that so in here it says edit description slash post id so whenever you put this colon before any variable in here something like this what it actually does is it creates dynamic routes for you so if i do un const id equals to request dot params dot post id all right now i'm going to be teaching you about another function called post dot find by id and update all right so if in the first parameter of the function you'll be giving the id and the second parameter you'll be actually telling what you're going to update so you have to write it exactly in the way i'm writing description as whatever is the request dot body dot all right and of course we're going to be sending a res.json update and we're going to be sending back the update in here all right so Hopefully I put everything correctly in here. So we're going to be coming here. So suppose I want to edit post number one. Okay. So first I'm going to write here edit description. Let me make sure the spelling is correct. Slash and I will actually copy this right here. And I'm going to paste it. Edit description and in the body i'm going to send it a description all right this is i'll say 
I love this post or something of that sort, alright? Make sure our server is running. It says connected to database. And we're going to be hitting send. This cannot get because it's not a get request, it's a patch request. Well, you get back. This is my first post. Whereas we had said, I love this post. We can check in a database once. And database, it has been updated. I love this post. But we are still getting back. This is my post from in from here. Because this uh, function, by id and update, it actually sends me back the old data from here which is the one it, which was there before so instead of doing that we can just give a response saying status updated all right so now this is cool we can actually create a post we can get the posts and we can also you know change the description of the post basically we can make an update to the database so now now i'm going to show you how you can actually retrieve one entry from the database all right so in this router slash router get posts it is actually giving you back all the posts but what if you want to get back one post so you can actually do a router dot get slash get post slash post id comma in here you can say const id equals to request dot params dot post id and now what you can do is const post equals to await and what we are going to be do using here is post dot find one or you know we'll be using this post dot find by id all right so what this find by id does is it actually filters the post through ids and we're going to do res.json post we're going to be hitting save here we're going to postman and in here we're going to say say get post and the id was already there the request is not a patch request anymore it is a get request we'll do that we'll fire up a server so that it's running and in here we're going to be hitting and it get gives back us post number one if we wanted to actually get back post number two we can copy this from here and we can paste this in here so that we can we are giving the computer the id of the particular post and when we hit send it actually gives me back this all right post number two so this is how you can get back particular post now if you want to remove a particular post so suppose you want to delete an entry from the database what you can do is you can create a delete route so you'll say router dot delete delete post slash post id comma async request and response all right so first of all we'll take the id here request dot params dot post id all right and we're going to be doing await post dot remove and we're going to be removing the post with the id equals to id 
all right and then we're going to save res.json status remove post all right so we're going to hit save we're going to start up a server we're going to go to postman we're going to make a delete request and here so here as you can see this id is of the second post and hopefully when i hit this it says status remove post now when we come to our database and we refresh well you can see post number two is gone so you can also delete posts using their own JS app so I guess we can stop the video here I've told you how you can create your post how you can get a post how you can get all posts how you can edit a post and how you can delete a post so you can create read update and delete from the database using your own JS app so guys, I think that is it for this section. In this section, we learned about the basics of a database and how we can use MongoDB from a Node.js app to perform the CRUD operation or creation, reading, updation, and deletion. And what we actually have here is a REST API fully ready for us to interact with the database. Thank you for watching this section and I'll see you in the next section. Okay, so guys, I guess this is the end of the course, there will be a lot more to learn and I suggest you to definitely make a project on your own and practice and learn from it. And if you run into any problems or anything, you can contact DSCVIT at all our official social media handles which is at the DSCVIT well on Instagram and DSCVIT well on LinkedIn. I will be putting the links in the resources section. As for me, you can definitely contact me on my personal social media handles. I will be putting them in the resources section again. And if you run into any problems, you can just freely ask us. And as for the course, I will be uploading a lot more content uh, on YouTube and on Udemy in the coming few days. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoyed the course.